Okay, uh, we just finished the uh, lumberjack show, and that was very good. It was very entertaining. Now we're going to our next excursion. You're welcome. What is it? Two o three. Or 283? 8251. 8251, okay. That's the town of Ketchikan. Big boat. That's my family right there. is to go down in the city and take a looky loo at all of our history and our culture of our city. And then we go out to Totem Bight State Park. And that's going to be a nice 30 35 minute walk around Totem Bight State Park. Are you northbound or southbound? Northbound, okay. I do have front seats if anybody would like to move up. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll move up. Oh, we got one, one taker from the back. Very good. All right, so we're on the bus for about 40 minutes, and then we'll be out at Totem Bike State Park and walk for about 30, 35 minutes. Any questions for me? Everybody feeling okay? Yeah. Yep. 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 yep, I just turned on the bus. Side of your window. <laughs> So welcome to Ketchikan, our little island of Revilla Gagadio. Our little island of Revilla Gagadio actually appeared 15,000 years ago. So it was 15,000 years ago, we were completely covered with ice. When that ice started to melt away and our glacier started to melt, we had new land. And with that new land, um, well, we have a lot of history. But the history that you just left that I like to always point out is the Lumberjack Mill and that Spruce Sitka Mill specializing in rafters and, and uh, boats, beams of houses and all those things because Sitka Spruce is very strong, strong wood and very straight, very round. It ran from 1904 to 1969 and it was the number one producing lumber mill in all the area. All the way straight ahead is that lime green, pistachio green house, which is Dolly's house. And that's the start of Creek Street, that red bridge right there. And that's our historical district. And that was very popular all the way from the 1800s, well, until 1954, when our Coast Guard actually stopped all that activity that was going on there. But straight ahead is the oldest church in town. Okay, we need to sit down, please. Oldest church in town is St. John's Episcopal Church. If you want me to stop at any time, just tell me, hey, Rebecca, we need to stop and do something, and I will safely find a stopping point for the vehicle. Then you can do what you need to do. What's the population? 
Population of our island is 14,600. The population of Ketchikan City that you're currently in is 8,200. Now, Chief Cayenne Toilet Pool right there on your right hand side is page 25 of American Passport. Page 25 of American Passport. And Chief Cayenne was very important because he was the gentleman that sold the land for that lumber mill to Mike Martin, one of our founders. And it was Mike Martin that started that whole history of that spruce mill you just left. So I'll give you a little bit of culture of what's in our area. The blue buildings on your right hand side is called the Mary Francis Condos. And those Mary Francis Condos have about six rooms just set aside as a contract with the hospital. Yeah, we have a hospital. So it's Anchorage, us, or Seattle for the any kind of hospital of any size. And if you are a lady that's about a week out from her due date, you're going to come and spend your time over here in the Mary Francis. Because you would not want to be on an island without a hospital and try to take a float plane when you start going in labor, okay? Or, like my father, he had some treatment, so a couple days a week he had to go to the hospital, right? That'd be pretty expensive to take a float plane over from that island that we were living on a couple days a week, so just came over here and set them up in the Mary Francis with a, with a pretty good deal. With that pretty good deal, uh, he was able to get his treatments weekly a couple times a week. Now, this is the back of Ketchikan Creek. So we have Ketchikan Creek and that red light district I, I started to introduce you to is the Lime Green House. And uh, this used to be just a foot trail on the left hand side. Now it's a nice wooden walkway for you. But that foot trail at one point was just uh, literally a trail through the woods and across the river, but it did not end up in, Dal in um, Grandma's house, right? Ended up in Dolly's house. Now Dolly's house and the other houses around in the area, all they would do is look, you look at your feet, look at your shoes, look at your cuffs of your pants, and they would charge you double depending on if they were clean or not, right? I know we got some families on board, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Pretty entrepreneur, though, Dolly was. Dolly came up here in 88. Well, she was born in 88 in Idaho. Came up here and she was 26 years old. But she was an entrepreneur during Prohibition time. She smuggled in Canadian whiskey. So she was smuggling in Canadian whiskey, and everybody else was making it in the backwoods which was making people sick, right? We have another entrepreneur. This young man on the left-hand side has a wishing well. Can you see the wishing well on the left-hand side in a black PVC pipe? Yeah? Anybody see that? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, that man, that young boy, has realized that thousands of people, we have 1.2 mil million visitors in six months' time. Thousands of people, just as these people are doing, walk by this area. And so he has a cute little saying on there about a boy wanting a fish, a wish for a fish. So you can put money down that PVC pipe right into the wishing well and help out his fishing fund, right? <laughs> Left hand side, the yellow green building. And look at that black and uh, brown total pole next to it. Can you see that black and brown total pole? Yep. Yeah. So that's our middle school, one of our middle schools. We have three. Elementary schools, two middle schools, two high schools, 20% of our population, 20% of our population is 18 years and younger. So it took heavy machinery to flatten this land in here, and that was the 1930s. So all of our schools and our park was created in the 1930s. Prior to that, we were just a straight up and down cliff system, and with that straight up and down cliff system, uh, we had nowhere to build our parks, build our well, our baseball fields, softball fields. So that all evolved after the 1930s. This is our oldest area of our town. This is actually the segregated area of our town. And with the segregated area of the town is the oldest uh, houses that we have here. So you can see how much rain we get with the siding of these houses, right? So 
tell that moss just growing on the side of the house? We had 13 feet of rain. 13 to 14 feet of rain every single year. You can see the roofs of our houses are pretty tough to keep up with. So it takes a lot of uh, upkeep and a lot of people are even switching to the metal roofs. That brown house on the other, on the right hand side has been redone and switched to metal roof. Kind of helps everybody out, right? Makes it a little bit easier. We have a church, and right here is the church on the right hand side, the yellow and brown building, but now it's our only mortuary. Gonna get you coming or going, right? <laughs> yep. But on your left hand side is East 3rd Street. Those stairways on your left hand side is a legitimate street. That's a legitimate street, East 3rd Street. Mahoney Street on your right hand side, that's a legitimate city street. Those stairways, we have 36 of them. Stair wooden streets, we call them, or stairway streets. 36 of them are legitimate streets. We were complete straight up an island, straight up cliffs, mountainous. That was the only way we could add to our island is to build on top of it before heavy machinery. Our shortest street right there on the right hand side. It's pretty short. But straight ahead is our university. So we're going to turn right and it'll be on your left hand side. That is our university. It only offers two year degrees. So if you want to continue on to a bachelor's degree, you would go on up to Fairbanks or to Anchorage. Or transfer everything to the lower 48 college, right? Those are your options. A lot of maritime classes, business classes, there's some nursing. Now about eight different majors. Nice total pool right by the university. So you can start to see our total pools are everywhere at our schools, at our universities, at people's houses. On your left hand side is an anniversary pool. This gentleman decided to carve a total pole for his anniversary, 50 years anniversary. That was quite an expensive gift. A total pole, you can commission a total pole, even you can commission a total pole, work by email, online with the master carver, and uh, you would be able to put a total pole up at your house. <coughs> On your left hand side, look at this high tide. Left hand side is Thomas Basin. And Thomas Basin on your left hand side used to be our flatland prior to the 1930s, and that's where we played baseball. So we played baseball here, there, until 1932 when we dredged the harbor and put up the harbor wall. Now on your right hand side you can see that lovely, wonderful, historical district that we have. All those buildings are historical, but only one of them actually is a museum and that's Dolly's house, that pistachio greenhouse. Coming up on your right hand side is another totem pole, it's a Chief Johnson totem pole. And that cat junk bird flying up high, we're going to see that again at Totobite State Park. At Totobite State Park we have a cat junk bird that's missing from the top of Fog Woman Pole. And the fog woman story is the bottom half of this totem pole. Okay, the bottom half of the totem pole is fog woman, and the top, the Kajunk bird represents the Kajunk clinkets. That's Chief Johnson's clan, and he had fishing rights right here at Thomas Basin in Ketchikan Creek. So having his fishing rights here, that's why he has a totem pole right there. Kind of a property marker, if you will, telling the story of that land also. Chief Johnson's Clinket, Kedrick Clinkets, and Bob Woman, their story, their belief system. Everybody likes Mexican food? Yeah. yeah. Alright, Mexican place on your right hand side, Chico's. Right? It's the best pizza in town. Pretty funny, right? Did you have another Mexican? The Mexicans are not very good. The pizza's not very good. Chico's just quite the bragger. Now, if you're into arts, is anybody into arts and humanities and plays and singing and music? We are a top 500 in the nation. Our little Ketchikan is top 500. First City Players on your left hand side has six full, complete, produced plays. And on your right hand side, Ketchikan Arts Community. 
Arts Council has um, three full festivals with art galleries and art festivals and all kinds of things going on there. So we are a very busy community with our arts, drawing, painting, carving, basket weaving, jewelry making, you name it, we've got it. City Hall and Police Station on your left hand side. All your other legal court system, DMV, is on your right hand side. So those two buildings really take care of everything you would ever need in our community. Legally, right? Now on, on your right hand side, we're going to go through this tunnel. Now this tunnel was completed in 1954. And the tunnel being completed in 1954 allowed us to develop a road system on the other side. Yeah, sure, the Eagle straight ahead. That's a tunnel pole. It was carved by Nathan Jackson. And what he was doing is welcoming you to Old Town and leaving New Town, which we're going to go to. And the Eagle was carved by Nathan Jackson. That's actually the second Eagle. The first Eagle had a problem. His tail wings had a little spot would collect water. And that spot rotted away, so his tail actually fell off. So he had to carve another Eagle. But the eagle represents Ketchikan. Because you guys know what Ketchikan stands for, right? No. No. Ketchikan actually traditionally is a clinket word that means eagle's wings. And that clinket word is something like Ketchikichi. And when we try to write it down, we wrote it down as Ketchikan, and I say we, I mean the Spaniards, the Europeans, the, all the influence at that time. They changed that clinket uh, word, Kichichi, to Ketchikan, put in our hard consonants, right? So this is a church, it was completed in 1936. This church was completed in 1936 up here on the hill. And uh, it's our second oldest church. It's the first Lutheran church. But our island is this straight up and down cliff system on your right hand side. But all these houses are from the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. And with all these houses that old, before 1954, before road system, if you have a straight cliff system, how did you build up there? Oh, I just had an eagle fly across the road. Look, on the straight ahead right, straight ahead right, you have a bald eagle flying just above the buildings now. We'll see here where he went. He might be still on the right hand side. Anybody see him land in a tree? Yeah. Huh. I wonder Sometimes on top of these buildings, on top of the electrical poles, light poles, sometimes we do see eagles sitting out there. So it's kind of a good spot to check. Never know. Normally, he likes to 
lunchtime. Yeah, it's 12.35. So for our First Nations, we have three different First Nations in the area. Blanket, Haida, and Simshian. Those are our three First Nations that we have. Now Haida, I think the, that, I just saw another eagle fly from the left to the right, far up. So our First Nations, Haida stayed a little bit further north towards uh, Russia area. Blankets were dead center in here, in this area. Just south of us into the Charlotte Islands and the BC Islands was mostly Simpsons, okay? But obviously today we're all mixed together, easy to travel, easy to tra um, get between all the areas. So, closest total pole to the road, coming up on your right hand side, is a clinket pole. Big, broad figures, brown and black. Clinkets. In the center, you have Haida, and on the right side, the red and the black, you have Simshian. Simshians are painting more modern, with more modern angles, and the red and the black colors. The clinkets tend to stay more traditional, with that brown and black and uh, gold figures. On your right hand side, we have the hospital, 23 temporary beds and 25 long term beds. So I know it's going to sound small to you, but it's a pretty good sized hospital for our little, for our little area. On your left hand side, container yard. So you can see we're truly in an island and everything comes on that island on a container barge. So we have stack up the containers four or five high and then you put on top a bus or put on top a boat. That's how we do it or piping or anything like that that wouldn't fit inside a container. We get container barges all summer long. Winter slows down a little bit, but the most important thing to us, right, is our refrigerated goods. Our refrigerated goods come on our ferry system over here on the left hand side. And on Tuesdays and on Saturdays, we get our, our uh, perishables, right? Our refrigerated goods. So we all go shopping on Wednesday and on Sundays. That's when you're going to get your fresh produce, all your dairy, all your meat, all those things. Occasionally something will not get ordered correctly. So there has been a couple of weeks we've gone without certain products like milk or eggs. It does happen. You're on an island. Everything comes in. If someone messes up on an order doesn't show up on the container. But on your left hand side, we have an airport. But the airport's on that other island over there. And that other island over there is called Grovina. So you can fly in by Alaska Airlines, by Delta during the summer. You're gonna loop down to Seattle. Seattle's their main hub. Let's see, where's our ferry at? Our ferry's at our, our, our side. See that blue and white guy poking up? That is our ferry. So you see the cars on the other side of the island waiting to come over. That ferry leaves our island on a quarter hour, three quarters hour. Goes over there, tops of a five minute ferry ride. Hooks up and then you can load in and come back over. So, It'll cost you about $25 for a vehicle round trip or $7 to walk on. So we typically walk on, just travel a little light, just bring your rolling bags, you're good to go. So there you there you go, a little bit about our lifestyle, a little bit about our city and our in our history of our city. We're getting outside of the city limits and we're almost to Totobite State Park. In about 15 minutes we'll be at Totobite State Park and I'll be able to get you to the restrooms if anybody needs. Anybody looking forward to the restrooms? Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Pretty, pretty typical after a lumberjack show. So questions, thoughts, topics? Pardon? Is this the warmest again? Um, this temperature right here outside? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, so this is actually a really good summer. This is a good, nice summer day for us. Nice and overcast and chilled. Um, we have had 80s and 90s. Um, that is 
not supposed to be normal, but we are having hotter days. Obviously, everything's warming up. And um, like last summer, we averaged 75 degrees. It was terrible, it was miserable. <laughs> um, averaging 75, right? So we had a couple 90 degree days. Now, um, this is more, this is, this is pretty normal, but it should be. But we should be getting more rain. So we're in a drought. We've been in a drought since last summer. And all winter we didn't get much rain at all. And now you can see we haven't had any rain and we haven't had rain in ten days plus. We could have sent you to New York. Yeah, bring it really when you go home just tell that rain to come over in this direction. We will take it off your hands in a heartbeat. So we have five hydro plants and those hydro plants the reservoirs, right? We have to have the reservoirs and it goes down the dam and it builds that uh, gravity feed and that's what gives us our electricity. Five lighter plants, we're running off, off from diesel generators for the last nine months. So every single household, every single electrical bill has an $85 fuel surcharge tacked on every month because of the diesel generator. So I kind of feel like I'm paying for a motorcycle but I don't have it. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. It's about a motorcycle payment. $85, $100 a month. Not one of those big motorcycles, just a small one. Okay. Not a big Harley. That's alright, I get to live in a beautiful environment. Four years now. Yep. Originally Michigan, I lived in Michigan, lived in Flagstaff, Arizona, lived in Maui, lived in Chenjo, lived in Chajon, I lived in Macau. No, not military, just a gypsy, just a traveler, just like to experience new things. So everybody's doing okay, how about, um, other, well, first of all, other questions? Okay. One thing, your yes. cars. Yes. They come from off the island, you have to drive them off the island. Yeah, okay, the gentleman's asking about our cars, which would you believe there's 1.88 registered vehicles, cars, to every person? Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now there's one point three, four registered boats for every person. Now, obviously we have our visitors, right? So we have some pretty big transportation companies like this one, okay? We're calling off, we part, are part of Holland America Princess. So we do have big transportation companies like this one and uh, Alaska Coach and your, your cabs and all those things that increases that number. But to answer your question, sir, all those ferries. Well, first of all, if you want a new car, if you're living here and you want a new car, what you're going to do is do all your research online. Nowadays, we can do that, right? right. Research everything online, and then you're probably going to take a trip down to Seattle, either by ferry, Bellingham, Washington, or ferries going to Bellingham, Washington, or fly down to Seattle. And you're probably going to arrange it with a dealership already and test drive that car and you know figure out what you want and then you're either going to put that car on a container barge to ship it up here or you're going to go ahead and hop in that car and put it on a ferry system out of Bellingham, Washington or Prince Rupert, BC is a seven hour ferry and drive it up yourself. Okay. Yep. That's the options. We do have a couple used car dealerships on our island because obviously people get tired of the vehicles, they need to get newer vehicles, etc. So we have a couple used car dealerships. I think we have four used car dealerships, official dealerships. All right, and I have an eagle on the top of that tree. Look at the top of that tree on the left-hand side towards the ocean. Can you see that white spot? Now it's going to be coming up on your right-hand side, that tallest tree. It's a little sparing up top. You can see that eagle up there. Now it's kind of tough to see. Anybody see that eagle up there? Got to get some eagle eyes on you. Question, sir? Yes. All right. 
Sure. Do you have any malls here? Uh, you, you, did you see the McDonald's? That's it. Our plaza, that's it. Yeah, it's at plaza, big plaza. Yep. Where the McDonald's was and Safeway's on the other side. We have a couple little small boutique uh, stores in there, and AT&T, and Verizon, and another local phone company. Volvo. We used to have a dollar store in there, and that that's not that went out two years ago. So that's that's about it. No malls. All right, how about, how do you feel about the first nations? A little bit more history? Okay. So our first nations, as I said, it was 15,000 years ago, we started to show new land as ice melted away. As the ice, ice melted away, our first nations came across from Siberia and came south. Discovering new land, they kept coming south until they hit our area. And when they were in our area, they said, whoa, look at this amazing. and put them in museums because at that same time we were having steamships come up here our new visitors to Alaska we had about 2,000 every single year and they were looting and taking all those artifacts away from those abandoned villages besides the regular vandalism the regular nature that affects everything and tears down to all, all those wonderful flesh and residues so the CCC program had a project here save those items with the permission of the families okay now you have those items do items documented or you have them in museums you have that beautiful old western red cedar soda pole put up a new piece of western red cedar right next to it and recarve it so now we have our little kids that were taken at seven and eight and ten years old away from their families at 50 year old 50 years old recarving those soda poles 
They're trying to scratch their heads and trying to remember what Grandpa would did, right? So that's what we have here, ladies and gentlemen. This is all created from the CCC program in 1938, are the tuna poles. And I'm going to tell you all about the tuna poles and the meaning behind them, and how they built them, and how they painted them, the tools that they used. Okay? Let's start at this first pole right over here. This first pole over here is Thunderbird. And the Thunderbird Memorial Pool was the oldest pool in their culture. This is the second time it's been carved here, so it was recarved in the 1990s. And this carving represents a memorial pole. Think of a cemetery. And in our cemetery, some of our plots have flat little marble pieces. And some of our plots have sculptures or big tombstones, those kind of things. So someone of great importance, of great importance, a chief, a storyteller, a medicine man, had a two, have a memorial pole like this. Now they used to bear, they used to cremate their people. When they cremated their people, they would put their ashes in a bent box. That bent box went in the back right here where this oval structure is. So it would have opened up, they would have put the ashes in it, and they would have covered, covered it back up. So this is truly a memorial pole as you would have had ashes inside of it. Thunderbird's pretty important. Does any of my kids typically know the Thunderbird story? It used to be a puppet cartoon. It used to be a puppet cartoon too, right? Back in the 60s. Okay. Thunderbird. We'll tell that story maybe on the right home. I'll let you think about it. This pole is the next pole in their culture, and it's a great marker pole. And it's a great marker pole. A couple of things about it. It's yellow. Now they didn't have yellow paint until the Russians came. So that's a timestamp for us. The so yellow paint with the Russians, those big ships came through and they had yellow paint on it. And the artists that were working with the browns and the blacks and the blues went, I want that bright color yellow, right? And you imagine an artist doing that. And so they started trading for yellow from the Russians. So that's a timestamp for us. The next thing we know is there's no oval structure in the back. So it did not have ashes in it. It had a buried body right in front of it. And that was from the Russians because they are Orthodox. Orthodox religion says you can't cremate your people, it's bad. You're supposed to bury your people. So this is a timestamp for us in history after the influence of the Russians, the Orthodox religion. It's a grave marker, tombstone. Just like you have a tombstone. Yeah, let's go ahead and go into Tuna Bite State Park. Scarlet, come on. these beautiful woods right Who it was. so this is Tongass National Rainforest so we get 13 feet of rain so our topsoil is actually a leech and spongy topsoil okay and it's only about 6 to 12 inches deep so we actually don't even have dirt per se on our island so when we timbered our trees here in the timber industry that we had we would what's called clear cut. And when we clear cut, we leave behind all the stumps and all the tops of the trees because we need to start building soil, right? We leave behind the stumps so our seeds could fall inside those stumps, get protected from all that rain and the massive wind storms that we have in the winter time, establish themselves and then start to grow out of that stump. Use the stump as nutrients also, right? So there's one starting. Here's one that's pretty good size. You can see this tree is going right around the stump. And then you have one over there that the stump is already eroded. Pretty cool, right? So 
Would you imagine this trees, these trees, this forest is only 81 years old? The CCC program in 1938 had this great idea. And the great idea was to create a village, all the clan houses and all the total poles to show you their culture, right? And to, and to have their next generation start carving. By the way, I don't think I remember, I forgot to tell you since 1938, this culture is so alive for us. So in the winter time particularly, we're busy in the summertime, but the winter time we have carving classes, painting classes, basket weaving classes, bed box making classes, drum making classes, regalia making classes. The clan house that we're gonna go inside to, every, every second Friday, every second Friday of the month, there's a dance celebration. And the First Nations, 20% of our population, First Nations, well, they'll go in that clan house and they'll beat their drums and sing their songs as a dance celebration, teaching their next generation, everybody keeping involved in their culture. Pretty neat, right? So it's very much a live culture. We can teach, we are teaching Haida in our schools, in our high school. So instead of taking Spanish or French or German, right, they can take Haida as a second language, which is pretty neat. Yeah, so it's very much a live culture for us. Any questions about our forest? Where, man? They look like pine cones. Oh, these are little, little, little pine cones. Yeah, what she's looking at is these little pine cones. And these little pine cones are like the smallest pine cones of every, every, an evergreen, right? And where these little itty bitty pine cones come from is this tree right here is a hemlock. See these small little little itty bitty, uh, these are hemlock. 60% of our forest is hemlock, okay? Hemlock is a stronger, faster growing tree. That's why after 81 years, you're not gonna find any western red cedar, unfortunately. You're gonna find hemlock, you're gonna find alder, and you're gonna find Sitka spruce, okay? But not bad for 81 years, right? Pretty cool. There's a cool story about the hemlock, about the raven stealing the sun. So if we get to the point of telling that story in the ride home typically, think of how small these needles are and then you'll know what the raven did.
to build things right, right, okay? Though all those folklore mean something to our kids. They have folklore too. Now their folklore is closer to our Grimm's Brothers folklore. You guys know Grimm's Brothers folklore? Yeah. Pretty gnarly stuff, right? They had to have that gnarly stuff too, also, because they can't just have their kids going off fishing and playing in the ocean by themselves. Too many animals are there.
run it down, we replace the top piece with lead, so that protects that 13, 14 feet of rain, right? So that protects it from rain, and the number one, if you will, the number one destroyer of swimming pools is trees. So birds will come and sit on the top, and the birds will relieve themselves with what they ate, and that will put the seeds in the top, and the trees will grow right down there, just like a stone. Grow right down there, and you'll have a tree sticking out the top. So that's the number one destroyer of swimming pools. We need to protect it from that, right? Touch up the paint. Re-support the wings or other things that are added on. Re uh, put bondo uh, resin in between the cracks to help keep that from separating further. When you have a restored pole, ready to go back up. Okay. Yeah, good question. How much does one weigh? Well, question right to your rocks on the inside. So the older it is, the lighter it is. Now, a pole just about the length of that, that boy down, I've been able to lay down and I was able to pick it up. Yeah, Drew, uh, it was about uh, 70 years old. So, it just gets lighter and lighter. This one's 81. This is what's created first from the CCC program. Yep. It looks pretty good, right? But as, one, as someone asked me, this is one solid Western Red Cedar. The only thing we add on wings, we add on animals, we add on beans, and you can see Man and Bear hat, but we took it down too late. So that Man and Bear hat's a second carving. Uh, this one, the weather got to it and we waited too long to take it down. But the cat jump bird over there has been restored. Do you remember the Chief Johnson Toto Pool downtown with the cat jump bird flying in the night? The fog woman story? Well, that goes on top of the water fog and we'll all show you as we go out. Still, and, uh, yep. No, it's Western Red Cedar. Yeah, Western Red Cedar just took our Red Cedar closet. It has a natural oil to it that keeps bugs out. But it doesn't keep all bugs out. There's some little parasites that will get in there. So you'll see holes. When you see the holes, it's because the woodpeckers got to it. Because the woodpecker can't sense those little parasites. This is the clan house. Not yet. The bark of the Western Red Cedar makes wonderful. 
wonderful baskets and robes and all kinds of things. We have dried meat in a basket and put it underneath the store for the winter time. And this is where they lived over there? Yes, ma'am. They lived here. They ate here. They slept here. This is what they lived in. Immediate family and extended family. They say 40 to 60 people. Now, once they had enough people, right? Once you have enough people, you have enough manpower. If you have enough baby money, you can start to build another plant house. Because you saw the pictures with all the different plant houses, right? So once you grew, like your community did, your community didn't start the way it is now. Your community was a lot smaller and started to grow, right? Right? The little town I grew up in, 6,000 people, we got a bigger high school, right? We got a bigger library, a bigger rec center, right? The town grows, just like you. Your town can grow. Uh, that's a great question. It would take a long time. Um, you're talking a good 10 years, at least. Yeah. It would obviously depend on the seasons, right? Depend on how bad the weather was that year. It would depend also on how many people you have working on it. Okay? But traditionally, at least, you're looking at 10 years of work. Okay, just get out of the clam house. the biggest squirrel we have. It's called the red tail squirrel. It's the biggest squirrel we have. It's going to look like a chipmunk to you guys. But that little red tail squirrel is all we got. So, um, for some reason, the uncle that day, he's like, oh, I need myself a bull seal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes off and goes right straight up to that big bull seal. That bull seal wasn't have enough of it. all those pelts in his news and he sees this happen and he sees this happen and he's so mad and he's so frustrated he gets so angry and his hands are shaking do you remember the faces in the hands oh. okay if you don't remember the faces in the hands go back in there or look at your pictures they had faces in the hands he's so mad and he's so angry and he goes up to all the other seals leading his way up to that bull seal and he's popping them on the head and they're all talking over Everybody doesn't know what's going on. Everybody's looking around like, where did he come from? And he goes up to that, that big bull seal and he grabs him, wrestles him, and he starts to rip him apart. And that's what you see in that in that totem pole. So a lot of kind of different morals and ethics, right? Don't be lazy, but don't you know show off what you're, what you're worth and all those things. 
the hands, the faces in the hands, faces in anything, the faces in the blowhole. That means the strength of that entity. The strength of that boy was his hands. The strength of the whale, he could breathe a long time, go dive for 45 minutes to an hour. Mm, that's the strength of that entity. Alright, so anytime you see faces inside something. We don't have a beaver here, but if we had a beaver carved here, inside that, they always carve the tail up and they always put the face inside that tail. Those tails are very, very, very strong. How's Mark your pole? Who lives in the house? Clink it, now you know all about it, I can just tell you. Clink it raven. Clink it raven weasel. Clink it raven frog. Just like you, welcome to the Smiths. Okay. Now you have a story behind their house, just like you find the American flag, just like you find the uh, Kansas City flag. The story of this house and what they believe in, what they support, is that blackfish story. And then they're paying homage to the raven's mother. This is the raven's mother down below. So again, paying homage to your mother, the matriarchal society. That's all the story we have is right here. right hand side and he's wearing a bear skin kilt kind of thing okay so that also they use the owl we also use the eagle they like those red and white eight red blue and white eight red and white frog seven toes with a white lab coat maybe a little black and white uh nurse's hat right about the significance of the height of the poles. Let's talk about all of those poles as we go downtown. <laughs> go downtown. We go in the center point right down here. So you can go either way. We can divide and conquer. Let's get in that observation deck. You're going to see seven poles at the same time. They didn't call him a chief, they called him a spokesman. 
And it was the matriarchal uh, society that decided on someone, a male, to represent him and do the speaking. Uh, but he only said what they wanted him to say. And that's typically passed down from families, but it also, uh, you had to be the right person to do it. And that's jealousy between brothers, and the, the one brother is better than the other one. He carves the left, the first blackfish, and that ends all the jealousy. That's just kind of the end of the story right there. Um, you, now you have Haida, Haida, Haida. And this story bowl is about the sea otters. And being a sea otter, if you go fishing by yourself and your canoe capsizes, your upside down capsize, the sea otter is going to capture you. He's going to keep you and make you do his work. And then eventually you're going to turn into a sea otter. The last one, he's, second to last one, he's turned into a sea otter. The author of the pole is the devil fish. Every pole is different. Yeah, you gotta you gotta do all your education. You gotta have Kevin Shields, the First Nation, to tell you. But there's lots of books and there's lots of stuff I've read and lots of documentation. Yep. But every pool is different, man. Yep. He's capsized in his canoe. Yeah. And then the sea otter came and captured him. See? Yeah. Okay. Now you have the master carver pole. The master carver pole is the stages to become a master carver. Ten faces on that necklace. The second figure from the bottom is the master carver. Just like we have for doctors and lawyers in our profession, you have all the degrees, you have residencies, internships, you have to pass the boards, right? All those steps to become that profession, to become a master carver, they have ten steps, okay? So that's the master carver pole. His Eagle and his mother sings you the eagle. So he's got eagle on the top and the bottom. This one over here is the sea wolf or the sea monster, and that's a story about a shapeshifter. Now that young boy goes and asks his future mother-in-law to marry his daughter, and then she says no. When she says no, he goes and asks his friend the sea monster, the second the green figure with the stout is the sea monster. The sea monster slash sea wolf of the ocean kind of control the animals of the ocean. So he says, come on, buddy, help me out. So he sends a fish a day to the doorstep of the future mother-in-law. So then the future mother-in-law says, all right, all right, you can't provide for our family. So he's smiling really big on the bottom. He's got the staff of importance. And he has a potlatch hat on. So the very top green hat, everybody says, what is that? That is a potlatch hat. It's a hat of importance. And if you're giving the potlatch, you're, you're receiving a potlatch of the wedding, you're going to have that hat on. And you can see that underneath is kind of an animal, kind of a person, kind of a, that's representing that shooter. Now they still see that hat on this guy over here. This guy over here has got that hat on because he's the very first chief of all time. He's the very first chief, he's got a hat of importance. And down very bottom is a raven, and he's given that very first chief his very first grandson. So that's Ravensfield, the son story about the hemlock. The writer alluded to the little hemlock needle. So that's Ravensfield, the son story. Uh, so it's a good story for the most right home. So I had a question, lots of questions about these totem poles. And the first thing you've already noticed is there's a reason for a totem pole, right? House marker pole, memorial pole, village marker pole, historical folklore to teach morals and ethics, right? So you have to have a reason for a totem pole. Once you have a reason for a totem pole, you go out to those villages and you ask for a carver. You search your way for a carver. You commission that carver, the entire family comes and lives with you. You're going to provide food and shelter. You're talking five years, seven years, eight years, depending on the height of that pole, depending on the width of that pole, depending on the detail of that pole. And someone asked me, how do you, how big is a pole? Right? That's up to you and the carver. You're going to tell your family what you're doing, 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 what you're doing. You're going to tell your family for that pole and the carver, the artist. You're going to tell your family for that pole and the artist.
he's having a hard time. He's going out fishing every single day, and he's not having a good time. He's coming back with nothing. Oh, that's why they call it fishing, not catching, right? And so he comes back with nothing every day. So she gets an idea. She tells her helpers here, go, my helpers, and bring me back some, some spruce root. They would make baskets out of spruce root because spruce root doesn't have the oils of the cedar tree. Okay, so any kind of food instrument they'd use spruce root. So she told her helpers, go get me some spruce root. And they do. She starts to weave a basket, which takes several days, weeks. And all this time, the raven still is not bringing back any food for his family. She gets done with her basket, and she tells her helpers to go out to the ocean and fill that basket halfway full of water. When the basket comes back, they're all sitting down at the, at the fire at night inside the longhouse, and she takes her hands and she wishes it through that basket of beautiful ocean water. She tells her helpers, go ahead and pour that basket on the, out on the ground. When that water hits the ground, all of a sudden sockeyes start popping up. So she creates the very first salmon. And of course, her helpers provide, prepare the food and prepare the food stashes to feed all through the winter. Well, Raven, he's very upset. He doesn't know what to do. He's a young man and he's supposed to be providing for his family. So he actually mistreats Bog Woman. And as he mistreats Bog Woman, she's, I'm not gonna deal with this. So she gets up and she walks out of the clan house. And with her comes all the salmon that have been prepared and in the food stashes. And all those salmon follow Fog Woman into the creek system. And Fog Woman just continues on up into the mountains. And her husband's trying to reach her. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but she's just fog. She's turned into fog. And she reaches into the top of the mountains in the freshwater lake system and all those salmon are following behind her. And that's where she stays and the rest of her existence is there. She's constantly calling home the salmon every July and August. So now the First Nations have heard this folklore their entire life. And of course, don't mistreat your women. And women can provide for their family and they're just the same as men. And go to a freshwater creek system July and August and you will be able to feed your family with salmon, right? So several different morals behind that story. We're done with number 12. a whole lot to, to do this damage but uh, you can see there's actually five trees in there for this one root system so that's what happened um, now ladies and gentlemen we are at the end of our tour but what we do is we exit out here those bathrooms are right up top here and also 
keep turning right and you'll be back to the bus, right? And in front of that bus, what was there? Restaurant. A gift shop. Okay, so. And that gift shop has cookies and coffee and know, restrooms so. also. <laughs> and the bus is going to be rolling. I like to be 25. Um, but 30 would be all right. So 25, really, the bus should be rolling, okay? I got one no, so I can't teach you any clink today. Right. Oh, there is 30. So, so do the majority. Do they use clink and slang in, uh, in town? Ah, oh, good question. The lady asked if they do clink and slang in the town. Um, I wouldn't really say clink and slang. Um, there's definitely people that can speak like it. Okay. Um, we still have probably a dozen elders that can fluently speak like it, and they are teaching it to their next generation. Um, it's kind of true of everything, though. The next generations are not necessarily 100% involved in it, right? They have to have the interests, right? right? So, um, there's always a few, but not enough. So, unfortunately, they are losing their culture. Or not, I always say they're losing their culture. No way is they're lo losing their culture, but they're leaving, losing bits of it, like the language. It's diluting. Yeah, it's diluting. Um, but as I said, Haida is taught in the high school. And I have a really good friend of mine who works at the Heritage Totem Center, Josh, and his brother are learning Simshian. Um, and they were brought up, their mother uh, is Simshian, and they were brought up bilingual speaking Simshian as kids. Now, once they got to that certain age, as kids do, at a certain age, at teenage age typically, they kind of gave it up and spoke English because that's what was taught in the schools and that was what their friends were speaking and, and so and that's what they're reading yep yeah, exactly yep so but josh has gone back to it josh and his brother has gone back to it and if they if they become they have to know so much of their of their culture and then they will be given a name so they're not given a name in their culture of their culture name until they've earned it and every culture is a little bit different to what they have to do to learn it, uh, to earn it, sorry, to earn their name. And Josh, to give you an idea, Josh is 23 and his brother's 26. And they're working really hard to get their Simshian name. And that's growing up with almost a bilingual, you know, household. So, um, and Josh is working in the Heritage Totem Center um, giving tours and as a curator for his culture. So. And do they have, I know we have family out of in Hawaii, they've been there for 40 plus years, but the natives there, the, the native islanders, they have special um, lands that they can own for parts of the island that are, um, you know, they have to have so much of the native blood and all these types of things. Because Alaska is that for the, what did you call it, the first people? First Nations. Yeah, so the lady had a really good question, and I lived in Maui for, for three, four years, so I kind of know what you're talking about, but 
The lady was asking, in particular, the, the Hawaiians, um, they have some land um, that is set aside uh, just for the Polynesians and um, Tongans? They, they have a couple different cultures. Um, they here, um, they do not have that in a sense here. But what they do have is they do have some First Nations rights, like they're fishing and they're hunting. Uh, they have a little bit different rights to what they can hunt and what they can fish, um, and the times of year and the size and all that kind of stuff, and where they can fish and where they can hunt, and also um, animals like um, otters that most people cannot hunt, they can, they're given allowance because otter is very important to their culture. And um, so they have some allowances for that. Now, as far as land, the only land to our, is special to our First Nations here in Alaska is Annette Island. Now, Annette Island is just south from us. And actually, you could see it. If we took the road past town, you would be able to see Annette Island. And that is the only First Nations reservation, reservation here in Alaska. And that's actually from the Simpsons. Now the Simpsons, I think I, I kind of told you, the Haidas kind of established themselves a little bit further north. We're center Clinkets, and Simpsons were a little bit further south because the Simpsons actually went across Canada and came back. And when they came back, Canada has the same history as America as far as you know the missionaries and taking them out of their schools and fighting the wars and pushing them pushing them they're pushing them and pushing them into a certain area right? right and canada had rules about they can't have pot latches can't have just like america had you can't have powwows because that was a gathering too many people together right, right. you got the picture right, right. so they actually the simpsons were actually pushed all the way across into the bc area into the charlotte islands and when they finally got to the area that America owned now, um, America had passed that land act for the First Nations, and they chose in that island, and that's where they are. So they have just opened it up literally about six years ago. So it truly was a reservation, as, as you say, you had to have permission to go there, you had to have the right um, blood to, to live there. They just opened it up because they started a casino. Oh, of course. <laughs> so there is a small electronic computerized casino on Annette Island, so now you can go visit. But it's funny because I have been trying for two years. My other half and I were like, let's go there for a break, you know, let's see it. Eagle, Eagle flying ahead, flying right straight up in front of us. I got a car behind me, sorry. There's an eagle coming on your left hand side now. Right on top of the tree line. Sorry, I have a whole bunch of cars behind me. In fact, I'm going to safely pull over, okay? Nothing's wrong with the vehicle. Nothing's wrong with the vehicle. This is just what we do. We're a slower vehicle. We're going to let the locals go on by us. Now we have, we have to get pushed if we see another eagle, right? <laughs> So, um, yeah, does that answer your question, man? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so, questions, I can teach you some clinket a little bit. I can tell you a couple more stories. We have Eagle Boy, we have Raven Steel in the Sun. We have, oh, Thunderbird, okay. Yeah, so the Thunderbird you saw twice. So Thunderbird was that memorial bowl with the ashes, and Thunderbird bowl was also the one that was in the restoration center. That was a Thunderbird with a young man underneath it. So Thunderbird is not much of a story. What Thunderbird actually is, is a representation of a mythological creature. So that symbol of Thunderbird, what it is, is as hunters and gatherers, they went high into these mountains and they found whale bones. Now they found whale bones and they scratched their heads and they said, how did a whale get on top of these mountains, right? So they kind of thought about it and the other thing they couldn't explain was thunder and lightning from high in those mountains. 
And thunder and lightning high in those mountains, they, they were confused by it. But then they started watching the eagle. And it, just as we just saw, an eagle could fly really smooth and high. And when those big 10 to 12 foot wingspans that they have, when they do fly, they can make a kind of a good, a good noise to them. And the eagles swoop down and grab fish and take it high into their nest to feed their young. So they thought about it and they thought, well, maybe, just maybe there's a really big bird that could swoop down strong enough, big enough to pick up whales and take it high into their nesting area to feed their young. So as they did that, they now started thinking about that noise and they thought, yeah, yeah, thunders when that bird, that really big bird is flying. Okay. Now they kind of thought about it more and they thought, a whale's awful big and a whale's gonna fight coming out of that water and the talons of a bird could just rip through that skin. So maybe that bird also shoots that lightning. And so Thunderbird is a mythological bird that shoots lightning from its eyes and stuns the whale. And when it stuns the whale, it can grab that whale and take it high into the mountains and feed its young. Another bird. Makes it, makes it yeah. So we say that memorial pole that was carved of a Thunderbird, they say that that person of great importance probably had all those signs of a Thunderbird, right? Probably was very strong, was very big, and maybe even had a lightning personality. Yeah. <laughs> so the gentleman just noticed that road right there with our light is Don King Road. It's no relation at all to the sports guy. No relation to that boxer sports guy, Don King. King family is just a, it's a family name that we have here and it's, it's well known and they're well thought of and they actually own that land and they sold that land. Did you anybody see what was back there? No. Good, because you're not supposed to see it. <laughs> 20 years ago, a company came to our city council and said, we would like to put one of these on your island. And the city council took the public opinion and the public opinion was outside of the city limits. We don't want to see you. You are an eyesore. We don't want to see you. So you couldn't see it, which is wonderful. And you have to be very small. So what do you guys think? What store would be that? Walmart. Walmart, yes. Really? Walmart, we do have a Walmart. Like I said, it was about 20 years ago. And outside of city limits, we only lost a few, we lost a few businesses. And if most of our businesses, like Tongas Trading, actually adapted, and now they have like Columbia, right? Um, North Base, and some of the higher end sporting uh, suppliers. So that was a good, good benefit for some of us. Or some of us think that they used to Tongas Trading used to have house kids pans and plates, but now we go to Walmart for that. To give you an idea, this ship shipbuilder right here, Tom, uh, Vigor, Vigor has these huge dry docks so they can take care of our ferries and they can build our ferries. And also um, came into our company, came into our island about 12 years ago. Wonderful company. And to participate with our culture, they asked for and commissioned a tunnel pole to be raised in front of their business. So that gives you an idea. We're gonna see it coming right up here on the right hand side. This is Big Or and their total pole that they commissioned. Um, so even our new companies that come into our island are commissioning total poles and it's kind of a blessing, right? And to be a participant to uh, this culture and in this environment. So it's pretty important for us to have our First Nations here. Anybody else have another question or a story? Nope. Do you want me to tell my personal story? Uh, so, <laughs> my bosses always tell me I can't do this. They say, Rebecca, you're supposed to tell history and culture. And, but, uh, I, I, so I'm going almost on my fifth year of being here. 
So this is kind of heavy on my mind because it was the very first weekend I was ever here on the island. Um, do you want to hear what happened to me? Yeah, oh, sure. Just <laughs> don't tell my bosses, okay? So when I came up from, when I came up here, um, I actually came the ferry system and I took the ferry out of Prince Rupert, BC. So it, actually at the time I was visiting my brother down in Alabama and I got the word that I got the job. So I drove all the way up across the United States from uh, Alabama, north to south, and then went into Canada, beautiful drive by the way, into Canada. And I didn't get fuel when I was in Canada because I figured it would be cheaper here in Alaska with the oil, right? right. So my first weekend here, I had to go get fuel right away so that I could explore the island. And I'm a morning riser. I love 4.30 in the morning. My body just wakes me up. I'm good to go. I'm ready to go. Let's go on an adventure. Let's go hiking. Let's go do something. So I come down here at 4.30 in the morning to get fuel for my car. And did you notice on the way out, did you guys notice the Safeway fuel that we have yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah. So we have Safeway fuel right here, and that's where I came. Now what you need to do is you need to look from that Safeway, look right of that Safeway, and you're going to see a little white hut. It's got B&D written on it, and that little white hut with B&D is a coffee shop. You see that drive through yeah. coffee shop? Yeah. Okay, so I came down here at 4.30 morning, I'm getting fuel in my car, getting gas in my car, and another car pulls up next to me, and the guy, well, gets out with a cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh no, no, this can't be. But he's going to put it out. He never puts it out. And I think, oh man, let's go. Okay, all right, rough guys up here. But it's still gas pumps. And I just, I said enough. I said, I, I got enough. I'm on an island now, right? So I go inside to pay for my gas. And I come back out. And that entire, that guy, his entire arm is on fire. <laughs> and he's waving around. He's on fire. And he's screaming. I'm starting to scream. I'm running around. I have no clue where anything is. I'm trying to find that button to shut it off. And out of the corner of my eye, I see another gentleman. And this gentleman's walking up very purposely. I'm like, what is, what's he going to do? And he has a cup in his hands, and he throws it on the guy's arm, and it goes out. The fire goes out. And I'm like, what? Yes, we have a hero. And now I'm all happy and excited and relieved, and all the emotions have switched. So I go up to the guy and shake his hand. Oh, you saved us. Thank you so much. Good, smart thinking. I'll buy you that cup of coffee again. And I, I can't even get to him, and he's handcuffing the firearm guy. He's handcuffing him and putting him in the back of his car. And now I'm going, what is going on? Where did I move to? I can't keep my mouth shut. So I continue to go up to the guy, and I said, but sir, sir, doesn't he have to go to the hospital? Why are you putting him in your car? And he stands up from his car, and I look at him, I go, he's in a uniform. He's a police officer. I didn't even notice that. But he looks at me and he stares at me and gives me the dirtiest look I've ever had in my entire life. And he goes, you're new here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh my god, okay. But doesn't he have to go to the hospital? And he goes, you need to know something living here. I went, uh, okay, sir. Um, yes, sir. He goes, it's illegal to wave a firearm in public. Very good. That's why you're mom. <laughs>
that's what that comes out for. Thank you, thank you so much for coming out with me. I hope you had fun, and uh, hopefully you have safe travels. I'm sure you'll have safe travels. And come back and join us, right? We'd love to have you back again. Come back on a ferry system to spend a week or two. You can camp up here. You can have a good time. Go fishing. The story just entered Alaska Souvenirs game. Okay, we're gonna enter there. Didn't see any shot glass. Oh, fine, right here. Three, three for ten. Right there. Okay, put it in your bag. After the excursion, that's my dinner. You never run out of food in the ship. Never.
Well, we have moved. This is after the excursion. Bye bye, cat chicken. Cat chicken. Hi. Have you ever seen a plane land, baby? On the water? Look. Yeah, I've seen it. No, I'm not talking about a love boat, okay? I've seen it. The plane, the plane. Right there, boom. <laughs> 